I also work as policy advisor to the charity The Born Free Foundation, which many of you might know was set up by Virginia McKenna decades ago after the film Born Free was made in 1966, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. I also sit on the board of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, where I oversee the Veterinary Nurses Council, which really helps to set the standards for veterinary nursing in places as, such as Vale and across the country in veterinary surgeries and wildlife rescue centres. Uh, this is the second time I've been here on Open Day for Vale. I'd like to start by saying thank you very much to Caroline and to all the team that are here today for the work they do. These wildlife rescue centres like Vale have all been set up generally by volunteers like Caroline who've given up their lives to help wild animals. They play a very crucial role in helping rescue and rehabilitate wild animals that we, the public, find harmed or injured by the side of the road. Day in, day out, there are animals brought into this center from across this region and across the country. And Caroline and her team here are tireless in working to protect those animals, getting them back into the wild. So could I give a round of applause to Caroline and to Vale? Thank you very much. You know, to me, wildlife is terribly important because I spend my days campaigning to protect it. I spend my days working with politicians. I spend my days talking in the media about the need to protect it. And just really start with a badger issue. Obviously, the badger debate about badger culling has been one of the most crucial and important discussions, in my view, about wildlife protection, farming, and the environment in this country in decades. I'm about to publish a book called Badger to Death which tells the story of the last four years of my work campaigning to stop this mad, cruel badger cull. And what I've done when I wrote that book was really start to think about the politics of this, the science of it, but also about people, about people like you that are here. How do you react to something that is so wrong on so many fronts? Do you stay silent and do nothing? Or do you stand up and say, no, I'm going to protest against this. I'm going to let my MP know what I think. I'm going to take my campaign to the streets. I'm going to take it into the courts, into the fields. And that's what I really find has been so, so important about the Badger Cull, is that people have made their voices heard. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And the thing about Badgers is this. Badgers have lived in our house for about half a million years. They are our largest surviving predator. We have no bears left anymore in this country. We have no wolves left anymore. We are debating about bringing lynx back that I fully support. But the badger here is the last large surviving predator we have. Now most of us will never see a badger alive because they're nocturnal, because they're shy. We most often see them dead by the side of the road, but they are terribly important to our natural heritage. They are beautiful animals. Of course, the Wildlife Trust has the badger as its symbol, so many of us will see it that way. Many of our towns and villages, like Broxbourne and other places, have been named after badgers. Wind in the Willows, literature and books have been written to make us really think about this beautiful animal. But it's also been demonized in a way that's terrible through the ages. It never really had any protection. It wasn't considered royal sport to hunt badgers like deer. It was left to poor people in the countryside to decide what they wanted to do with this animal. In the 18th and 19th century, across this country, you would have found people digging out badgers with their dogs. You would have found badgers in inns up and down the country where they were kept in pens to fight with dogs for illegal gambling games. Now I'm afraid today, we think in our caring, compassionate world that that type of thing would never go on anymore. But it does. Up and down this country, the illegal persecution of, of badgers goes on. There are people that breed dogs to send down sets to kill badgers. There are legal gambling clubs that are established to fight with badgers. In fact, badgers are even being taken from their sets and are being put into pens in barns and fought with dogs in the most horrendous conditions. These animals are being tortured. These animals are being killed by badger baiters. But also we're finding that large numbers of farmers and landowners, I'm afraid, are also killing badgers. We're finding that property developers who want to build homes over badger sets are all too keen to put a bulldozer over them. Or maybe to put glass down the badger set. Or put petrol in some cases down it and set it alight. Badgers are skinned alive in some cases. They're shot, they're snared and they're gassed. This animal is at the front end of the most evil, evil persecution of wildlife in this country. And that makes me angry every single day. Now there are laws to protect badgers. Because people like you stood up to protect them in the late 60s and early 70s 
when the colony workers, when we had a big coal mining industry, used to take their dogs up and down the country at the weekends and kill thousands of badgers. There were individuals in society who got so angry about this that they set up badger protection groups. They used to sit on badger sets to protect them at night. They used to basically go out and put themselves on the front line of protecting animals against cruel individuals. And thankfully, as a result of what they did, in the early 1970s, the Badger got the first legal protection, the Protection of Badgers Act. Today, in our law, this animal has more protection against persecution and damage to its habitats than most other animals in this country today. But I'm afraid protection on paper doesn't give it protection in reality. And the other problem the poor Badger has found is become part of a bigger debate about the future of our farming industry. We have a problem about TB and cattle. Our cattle industry is a very intensive industry. We move millions of cows across the country every year. We keep large numbers of cows inside for long periods of time. And I'm afraid that leads to the transmission of diseases like TB. The problem for the poor badger is, actually the TB has gone from our cattle industry into our wildlife. The badger has become infected with TB, and then the badger is being blamed for in turn infecting the cattle. Now when I wrote my book, Badger to Death, I went back and looked at all the evidence to see if I could find good scientific peer-reviewed research that would tell me that actually badgers can easily pass TB to cattle. And I'll tell you this, there isn't any. There is only one experiment ever undertaken in 1975. The Central Veterinary Laboratory in Weybridge in Surrey, they decided to try and find out if badgers could pass TB to cattle. So they took some healthy badgers and they injected them with large amounts of TB to the point where the badgers were going to come very ill and they were going to excrete the TB through their skin, through their feces and through their urine. And then what they decided to do is they were going to lock them in concrete pens, about a third of the size of a football penalty area. They put concrete on the floor so the badger couldn't dig its way out and they put a steel door in so it couldn't break its way out. And then over a period of time, they took healthy calves and they put them inside these pens with the badgers. The calves couldn't escape the badgers and the badgers couldn't escape the calves. And the badgers were defecating and urinating where the calves were. And you know what? It took over six months, six months, for the first calf to become infected by TB in those conditions. And over a period of a year, a small number of calves are infected. And when the scientists finished that piece of research, they came up with two conclusions. Firstly, it wasn't fit for purpose because what you were doing in this very artificial environment didn't reflect what was going to happen in the farmed environment, in the pastures, in the fields, and in the farmyards. And secondly, and even more importantly, they reached the conclusion that yes, a badger can pass TB to a cow, but it's extremely difficult for it to do so, even in these very, very artificial conditions, and it takes a very long period of time for it to happen. Now you might think, if that was the results of that research, that we would give up on killing badgers. But I'm afraid since that research was done, there has been nothing else ever done similar. There has been no field research to prove that badgers can easily pass TB to cattle. There's a lot of lies from politicians, there's a lot of lies from vets, there's a lot of lies from the farming industry, but there is no evidence to show that this poor animal here is actually infecting cattle. What the evidence does show us is that cattle are infecting other cattle and the cattle themselves are infecting our wildlife. We are pouring TB into our wildlife, not just our badgers, our rats, our deer, our cats, domestic animals, increasingly are carrying this disease. No fault of their own, it's a fault of our farming system. So when anyone tells you, if you talk to your local politician, that I know that badgers pass TB to cattle, you can tell them from me if they don't. You can buy my book in July when it's published, and you can go and send them a copy, and you can say, read it, because the evidence is not there. And that means, basically, that over the last few years, we have killed 4,000 or so badgers and spent 25 million pounds testing none of them for TB in the most cruel and horrible way for no justification whatsoever. That is the most expensive wildlife kill in history. It's a huge waste of money. It's not helping farmers deal with the disease in their cattle. And even the independent expert committee that the government set up for the first year of the curse found that between 5 and 23% of the animals shot were not being adequately monitored 
the people killing them are not properly trained, and actually the animals themselves were dying of multiple gunshot wounds, they were dragging themselves off of blood loss and organ failure, and dying in the most disgusting conditions possible. Do any of you here think that's acceptable, do you? No, it isn't. It's disgusting, and it's wrong. And that's why the Badger Army was formed. That's why we have marched in 36 towns and cities up and down this country in the biggest wildlife campaign of its kind anywhere in Britain or in Europe for decades. That's why we forced this issue into the High Court. That's why we've had three debates in Parliament. That's why over 330,000 people have signed a petition. That's why we've put wounded badger patrols going into the fields in their hundreds. That's why hunt sabs have been going into the fields to take on the people that do this because they're not being monitored properly by the government. Do you think that's right? Of course it's right. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. That's what people power is about. That's what this wildlife movement is about. It's about people standing up and it's about people being counted. Now we are at a crossroads in this policy. We're saying to the government, you have no evidence to prove that all those budgets you've killed have any TV. We have plenty of evidence to show that they've been cruelly killed and we have plenty of evidence to show that it's not working. If you look at the results of the DEFRA statistics published every few months for TB in this country, we're seeing a steady increase in TB in herds in and around the cold zones, and the new incidence of TB in the herds continues to rise. But there is an alternative policy. If you look at Wales, they've done things differently. The Welsh Government decided it wasn't going to cull badgers. It was going to put in place tighter controls on testing, tighter controls on movement, and it was really going to come down on biosecurity at the farm gate level as well. And over the last few years, that has started to deliver real benefits to farmers. We have seen a 48% drop in new incidents of TB outbreaks in the herd in Wales over the last five years. We have seen a significant drop long term in how incidents occur in herds. And they're beginning to find the cattle and they're removing them from the system. And the reason they're doing that is because they're testing annually across the whole country, which the English government here refused to do. They're using something called gamma interferon blood tests alongside a skin test that we've used since the 1930s. You combine the two tests together, you find the TB reactors, those animals with the disease, far more effectively, and you can remove them. And what they've also got alongside it is vaccinate badgers. Now, I'm not telling you vaccinating badgers is going to reduce the risk to cattle, because I don't think badgers are going to pass the disease easily to cattle anyway. But it is worth vaccinating badgers because it reduces the level of TB in animals that are not infected and it reduces the level of transmission when it comes to newborn cubs. And it also has the benefit of building bridges between the wildlife protection organisations and the farmers and landowners. Because this badger court policy has poisoned that relationship and it's caused such distrust that if we can go to a farmer and work with them and vaccinate their badgers, then we should. But I'm angry because the government has suddenly run out of vaccine as well. They're telling me at the moment we don't have enough BCG vaccine because it's a global shortage. We're telling them there was a global shortage, but it's over. They're telling us we only have one supplier in Denmark and we can't get that back online in the near term. We're telling them there are other alternatives abroad. We want you to work with them. We want the Veterinary Medicines Directorate to approve licenses to bring in those vaccines. Wouldn't you agree that we should be by next summer vaccinating badges again? Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Exactly. No excuses. We want to work. There's nowhere in the world that I could find people that would give up their time to train as vaccinators, to go into the fields at night looking heavy cages, to help farmers deal with the disease in their cattle. To be the fair, they pretty much created themselves by the farming systems they operate in. We, the public, are working to help them. I'm proud of this country, the fact that we do that. But what I'm saying to government is you must work with us, hand in hand, to help us to achieve it. We're also saying this. The last week has been a massive political and economic earthquake in this country. Whatever your views on being in the EU or out of the EU, DEFRA, the department overseeing the badge poll, now has some massive, massive problems to deal with. Poor old Liz Truss has probably got the most difficult job in government, and I, for one, am quite happy that she's in the hot seat. But we're saying this to her. We're saying that you can no longer afford to waste tens of millions of pounds killing badgers when you've got a crisis of how we're going to continue to support farmers in this country. Because DEFRA gets most of its money through the European Union Common Agricultural Policy that we pay billions in and billions comes back. We shut all that down. Farmers are going to need significant support from all of us here through our taxes. And we're saying to DEFRA, 
and Liz Truss and the NFU that you've got a massive problem to deal with now. You focus on that and you leave the poor badges alone. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And we're also saying this to her. She gets 30 million euros a year from the European Union to help pay for the TB eradication policy. It compensates farmers for their cows that are slaughtered. It helps pay some of the TB testing costs. It does not pay for badger culling. You can be reassured of that. But that 30 million euros is now going to disappear. There's a black hole that's going to grow very, very quickly and she can't afford to pay for it. So we're saying next week as the Badger Trust is that we want to stop on badger culling. We want to stop on the extension of badger culling. We're going to call her bluff saying you can no longer afford this mess. There's no scientific benefit. There's no animal welfare benefit. The farming industry is in crisis and you must stop killing badgers. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Exactly. So we're going to win this argument. We're going to win it through fighting. We're going to win it through being committed. And in the end, events that are going on around us in that big geopolitical world in which we live might play to our benefit. I want to talk about a few other things that I do because I'm involved in many campaigns. And I think we are beginning to move issues forward, not just on badgers, but on some other big things as well. We're at the anniversary in the last few days of the death of Cecil the Lion. Many of you will remember last year what happened there. Our friend Mr. Walter Palmer, the dentist from Minnesota, basically went off to a nice holiday in Zimbabwe. In Hwangi National Park, he decided he wanted to kill a lion. He got himself a guide. He went into a national park illegally. He lured the lion out. It was a lion that was collared as part of an Oxford research project. He shot it with a bow. He didn't kill it outright. The animal disappeared into the bush. It took them another 40 hours to find it and to shoot it with a gun. And you can imagine the pain and suffering that animal went through. He then removed the satellite collar to deny all knowledge that it was a research animal. And he made preparations to skin the animal and take the head back to the United States. Thankfully, a friend of mine called Johnny Rodriguez in the Zimbabwe Conservation Trust got onto it. Found out who he was, found out what was going on. And I was working in the Born Free office in July, just over a year ago, and I got this fax come through. And it said, we've got information on this man that's killed this lion. And it gave the name of the man, Mr. Palmer, his business address in the United States, his passport number and everything. And I was saying to my colleagues, if this is true, this is going to be a massive story, but we've just got to wait for those details to be verified. The Daily Telegraph rings me about half an hour later and says, we verified it, we're going to put it on the front page in the morning, want to interview you, which I did. I then went on Sky News and did a live interview, and then I went on the BBC World Service to be interviewed with a lady called Rebecca Francis that some of you might have seen on that Channel 4 programme this week when she was talking about her religious, wonderful experience of murdering all our most endangered species around the world. By the time I'd finished doing that piece of work in a few hours since that story broke, this became the biggest global story anywhere in wildlife conservation that I've ever seen. I got a call from the BBC and said we want you to come up to Salford Media City and be ready for a whole load of interviews, BBC Breakfast, the Today programme in the morning, this story is exploding. Which I did. Made my way up to Salford, got there for about midnight. By the time I got into the hotel, I had 15 interviews lined up for the next day. By the time I got into the BBC centre at 6 in the morning, me and the security guard pretty much alone, I looked at all the screens and Cecil the Lion was leading every major news channel in the world. And I looked down at all the newspapers and it was front page in every one of them. And the security guard says to me, you're the lion man, you're you going to be busy today. And I was. But this important thing about this story is when I spoke and then others spoke from other organisations, the level of global interest kept growing. The numbers of people posting pictures of dead lions around the world sparked a global debate that we'd never seen. By the end of the day, Angela Merkel was talking about it. President Obama was talking about it. David Cameron was talking about it. We had Cecil's face on the side of the Empire State Building. We had airlines queuing up to stop shipping trophies. We had shipping companies saying they weren't going to move them anymore. Within weeks, we had the American government putting forward legislation that had sat on for over a decade to try and restrict the level of trophies coming in from the United States from hunters. Within months, we had the Dutch government, the French government, and the Australian government all banning trophy hunting of lions and trophies coming in to their countries. That is because of what you achieved as individuals using social media and campaigning. You shamed governments to do something they should have done a long time ago. And people say to me, Dominic, are you sentimental about animals like lions? We probably have less than 15,000 lions left in the world today. And if we keep killing them the way we are, they will disappear in our lifetime. The youngest children here today 
could see the end of lions in the wild. The only places they would see them will be in zoos and safari parks. Do you think that's acceptable? Do you? No, it isn't. But it's a wake-up call to all of us that we must do more to stop it. Cecil was a lightning rod debate that sparked a whole discussion around the world about protecting wildlife. And it goes on. Another big campaign I've been involved with, working with Sea Shepherd over there, who do fantastic work, is about the, the situation in Taji Cove in Japan. Now, many of you will have known about Taji because you've probably seen The Cove, the 2007 film that won an Oscar as the best documentary. Rico Barry, the former trainer of Flipper, who turned conservationist and campaigner for tech dolphins, helped make this film that really went behind the scenes on this horrible practice of dolphins being killed in their hundreds in this one cove in Japan, and then some of those dolphins being taken away on jumbo jets flown across the world to marine parks. Now what we've been saying about this is beginning to make a difference. Over the last few years, every few months, we've had thousands of people outside the Japanese embassy in what is the biggest rolling campaign of marine mammals anywhere in Europe, and probably in the world, to draw attention to Taji. And over the last 12 months, we've started to make a huge impact. The Japanese Marine Aquarium Association, that used to take dolphins from Taji Cove to put in its marine parks, was shamed into stopping doing that this year. We started a global debate that's not SeaWorld share price through the floor. We've seen off one CEO, we force them to accept they can't continue to breed orcas anymore, and they'll have to bring an end to it. And we've started through Blackfish and other films that we've seen, a global recognition that marine parks are little more than concrete prisons, that put the animals at risk, and actually put the humans that are actually in the water with those animals at risk as well. A number have been killed over the last few years. We're making younger generations of people think that actually it's not acceptable to take these highly intelligent marine mammals, to butcher them in huge numbers, and then take the best looking ones from their pods and put them in marine prisons. We know that the actual fishermen in Japan get on average about four or five hundred dollars for a dead piece of dolphin meat. And that ends up as dog food as fertilizer, so most people won't eat it because it's got lots of heavy metal in it like cadmium and lead. But we also know that a good-looking dolphin that can be trained and selected brings in about $150,000 a piece. And that's the problem. It's greed and corrupt, not culture, that's keeping this going. And what we're saying to the Japanese government, what we're saying to marine park businesses like SeaWorld, what we're saying to governments around the world is that you must give these animals greater protection, that you must stop the exploitation and trade in them, and at the end of the day, we, as individuals, must stop going to places for so-called entertainment that involves the torture of animals. Wouldn't you agree? Exactly. And that's another huge step forward that we've taken. We've got the CITES conference coming up in South Africa in a few months' time. It only happens every three years. And there'll be big global debates about protecting animals. But there are a number of very important discussions happening. What about elephants and rhinos? In the last year, we've probably lost over 35,000 elephants alone, one every 15 minutes. The demand for ivory in Southeast Asia is insatiable. But we are making progress. We're campaigning, we're marching, we're bringing thousands of people into London and other cities around the world, and there'll be another big global march for elephants and rhinos taking place at the beginning of the CITES conference in September in London and other cities around the world. And what we've managed to do is we've broken up governments to the plight of these animals before it's too late. If we go on butchering what's left of our elephants and rhinos in Africa, again, they could disappear in the wild in our lifetime. At the moment, rhino horn is selling in its ground up form at over $67,000 a kilo in Laos, Vietnam and Thailand. Now, it's no more valuable than you grinding up your toenail or your fingernail. But there are certain individuals that have perpetrated a myth to sell this stuff to say it will cure your cancer, it will make you more virile and all this other nonsense. And people buy into it. And we also know that we have huge problems with regards to the issue of ivory and elephants. Because there are certain individuals that still believe you can take an elephant toss without killing the elephant. It's just like an antler falling off a deer, it isn't. You have to cut the tusk away from the elephant. You cut through a membrane and the animal dies of blood loss in the most disgusting way. Horrible, horrible way. And we also find that the demand for ivory is being fed, not just through people who want to trade it illegally, but also through the antique markets as well. There are many antique traders that will continue to want to sell ivory 
in many auction houses in this country around the world. So we're saying this. We want an international trade ban on ivory and rhino horn. We want to see proper protection of these animals into the future. And that governments around the world must now recognize, unless they take these measures, and South Africa is going to be a very important step to take them this year, we will not protect the future of Africa's elephant herds and rhino herds. Wouldn't you agree? Exactly. And when it comes to lions, as I said earlier on, the numbers of lions are falling through the floor. But the breeding of lions is going up. South Africa alone breeds over 5,000 lions in intensive can hunting operations in the most disgusting conditions. But it makes an awful lot of money. The South African government are quite happy to see these farms grow. The hunters can come in from around the world. If you want to hunt yourself a lion in Tanzania, you will pay on average about $100,000, $150,000. You'll go on a safari, you'll spend two weeks in the bush, and you're probably about a one in five chance, maybe one in ten in some cases, of fighting the lion and killing it. So what the breeders in South Africa have worked out is we breed the lions, and they can breed them very easily. We can reduce the cost, and we can guarantee a kill. So rather than charge you $150,000, $200,000, they offer it for $20,000 or $15,000. It's getting cheaper. And they fly people in from around the world. I could take you on the computer internet now and I could book you a holiday to kill a lion. You could be in South Africa tomorrow. Within two days, you could be shooting it. The lion would have been hand-reared. It would have been put in a petting farm. The tourists will come into South Africa and think, this is wonderful. I can spend a week looking after lion cubs and get lots of pictures and put it on Facebook. I go home, the lion grows older and it goes into a hunting operation. They don't care or they don't know, but it's happening. And by the time the lion gets into those operations, it's basically put in a confined space, it's brought out to a bait station, you sit on the back of a truck with your gun, you don't have to be trained, you'll have a go at shooting it, if you wound the animal, and most of them do, then a marksman will be sat next to you try to finish it off. You take the head, you take the skin, and the bones are left with a lion breeder. The problem is the bones are worth a lot of money, because they grind those up and turn them into wine and potions that go into Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand. So we're finding that the bones of those lions that are being bred for the shooting operations are feeding more demand for killing not just lions, but also tigers as well. This is a vicious circle based upon greed, corruption, and ignorance. And it's destroying this species at a rate that we could never even have imagined even 10 years ago. So there'll be a huge debate in South Africa about uplisting lions to most endangered status, spe status species. But governments, even here in the UK and across Europe, still believe that there is some justification allowing the hunting of these animals. They still believe there's some justification in allowing the farming of these animals to be shot. And what we're saying, and what you must do supporting groups like Born Free and I4 and other NGOs, is that the day when we hunt lions should come to an end. The day when we actually kill these wonderful animals to put their heads on our wall or their skins on our floor should come to an end. This is cruel, this is disgusting, it's based upon greed, and it's wiping out an animal that's lived on the African continent for tens of millions of years. And in our lifetime, unless we stop this madness, they will disappear forever. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Exactly. So it's an important year, isn't it? We're fighting for badgers at home. We're fighting for elephants. We're fighting for lions. We're trying to stop the madness of marine exploitation and killing of our most beautiful marine mammals, dolphins and whales. But also we're seeing other campaigns on animal welfare that are also sparking global anger. I only have to mention Yulin to many of you here to know what that means. We've been celebrating our beautiful relationship with dogs today. And it's a campaign that I've been increasingly getting involved with in the last year or so. I've never seen anything globally that has caused more anger than what we're seeing in Yulin. It's not that Yulin is special. It's one city in China where thousands of dogs for a period of 10 days are killed in the most disgusting conditions, and cats as well. The animals are often taken illegally from private owners. There is a view that if the animal is under great stress when it's killed, the meat will be better when you eat it. So the animals are often slashed and cut alive, they're blowtorched, they're boiled, they're skinned alive in the most disgusting, gruesome conditions anyone on this planet could ever consider. Now people say to me, are these animals any different to any other animals? Are our relationships with dogs and cats special? I'll say this to you, regardless of what happens when the animal is dead, when you kill it, what you're doing to the point you kill it is an animal welfare issue. And if you're torturing it, if you're cutting it open alive, if you're skinning it, if you're boiling it, 
If you're putting a blowtorch against it, that's a sin. That's disgusting. That's illegal in this country. It would be illegal in animal welfare Europe in, in Europe and North America. And it should be illegal in Southeast Asia as well. Wouldn't you agree? And that's the point. We have to bring about a global recognition of how we treat animals. Now, dogs and cats, to me, are very important. We know that dogs particularly have been our companions in our lives and our so-called civilization on this planet for tens of thousands of years. We're only beginning to realize what impact they have on our mental and physical state of mind. Whenever there's a great tragedy, it's often dogs are on the front line. Recently in Texas, the last of the 9-11 surviving dogs died, a 16 and a half year old Labrador Retriever, the first animal to go into the Twin Towers when it came down with a group of other rescue dogs. It lived a long and happily life with its trainer who looked after it from the days it went into that horrible, horrible hellhole. But it made me think about how important these animals are at times of human tragedy. Across America and Europe, many people that come back from war with tragic scars that impact the way they deal with people around them that can lead to violence, depression, and suicide are only lifted out of that blackness by the relationships they have with dogs. Dogs carry them back from a place that no humans could ever do. My home city of Milton Keynes was seeing research being done for dogs to sniff cancers physically. And we know they can smell them. We know they can find them on us. Humans across the world are reporting cases of cancer that their dogs have found on them that doctors would never have found. And we're beginning to understand the complexities of their smell. And if we can use that in creating effective electronic devices to prevent cancer, we could save millions of lives. These animals play a huge, important role in our lives. And that means, to me, that it's not acceptable to slit them open alive, it's not acceptable to put them in boiling vats of water, it's not acceptable to cut them to pieces, and it's not acceptable to butcher them in the most horrible ways to mankind. Wouldn't you agree? And that's why what we're beginning to see against Yulin, I hope, will be a wake-up call for how we treat animals around the world. This campaign is growing. In London, we've seen massive demonstrations. In China and across Asia, particularly in Korea and Thailand now, we're seeing larger numbers of people getting involved. And I'm working on a major demonstration in Washington, D.C. in the run-up to the presidential election that I think will bring masses of people into the city to show how angry they are about this as well. And I wanted to end on that point because that's what it is for me. It's not about just wild animals. It's about all animals in our lives and how we treat them. And it's about why we want to stand up to make this a better world. Now, lots of people will always stand up and say things divide us. You know, we don't like this person because where they come from or the color of their skin or their religion. What I love about animal welfare, wildlife, animal rights work is it brings us together regardless of where we come from regardless of our skin color, our ethnicity, our religion, or whatever it might be. The one thing that unites us is a care and compassion for animals. And if we care for animals, we generally care for people better too. And that's why places like Vale here are so important. That's why you coming together today to say that I really want to be part of this and support it is so important. And that's why if you're campaigning, if you're a member of groups like the Badger Trust, and please, please join and support us because we need your support like never before. If you're campaigning against fox hunting, if you're campaigning against Yulin, or the killing of lions, exploitation of marine mammals, what's happening to our elephants and rhinos? If you're getting on the streets, if you're on Facebook, if you're supporting NGOs, you're making a difference. You are waking up the world to the fact that we will no longer sit silent and allow animal suffering to go around us. So thank you very much for supporting Vale. Thank you for doing all of what you're doing, supporting the Hunt Sabs and the Badger Trusts and the Wildlife Trusts and all the other charities that I know you do support and you work hard for. Keep doing it. Keep sharing your views on social media. Keep telling your friends of all ages that they should think about what's going on with animals as well. It makes us a better people, a caring, compassionate people, and that's what we're fighting for. Thank you very much.